It's said that modern aircraft have four dimensions – span, length, height and politics. The TSR-2 was a world-beating jet bomber which got the first three right, but ultimately fell foul of the last one. In 1957, British aviation was flying high. It was producing the most advanced jets in the world, ahead of everyone else, including the US. The English electric Canberra set a world record for altitude at 70,310 feet, over 21 kilometers. The Canberra was Britain's first jet bomber and was more capable than any other aircraft of its class worldwide. It was widely exported with America building more than 400 under license. But there was concern that soon the Canberra would be threatened by new Russian interceptors, and a new high-altitude reconnaissance and bomber aircraft would be required. At the time, the British aircraft industry was made up of many different manufacturers, all feeding into the large defence budget. But Britain was spending far more than it could afford, and in September 1957, the head of the Ministry of Supply called a meeting at Shellmex House in London, gathering together the chiefs of all the major aerospace companies. There, he announced that the Canberra replacement would be the government's main aerospace contract, but the job would only go to those companies who agreed to conglomerate. Basically, merge or die. The government was determined to cut the fat for a more streamlined aviation industry now that ballistic missiles would carry the nuclear deterrent. The new aircraft had an ambitious specification. The RAF wanted an aircraft that could take off on over a thousand airfields in Western Europe with just 600 yards of runway. This was considered necessary because in the event of a nuclear war, all the major airfields and runways were expected to be destroyed. As well as being capable of stall, a short takeoff and landing, the new aircraft was also expected to fly at Mach 1.1 at 200 feet and Mach 2.2 at medium to high altitudes. Not only was the new aircraft to be the successor to the Canberra, but it could also be possibly a replacement for the V bombers, Victor, Vulcan, and Valiant. After the meeting at Shellmex House, the initial shock gave way to fierce competition for the big contract. Vickers, headed by Sir George Edwards, put forward a single-engine design called the Type 571. Although Edwards was a capable administrator, Vickers' only real experience with high-speed jet bombers was with the Valiant V-bomber, which, due to structural issues, had to be withdrawn after just five years. English Electric, on the other hand, had built the successful Lightning supersonic fighter with the super-successful Canberra. They submitted a proposal for their P-17, an advanced concept design that used a detachable vertical takeoff and landing aircraft called the P-17D. It was a radical idea, but the company had proven themselves with the success of the Canberra. Vickers, however, won the prime contract and were responsible for the front fuselage section, cockpit and weapons. English Electric were to be contracted to build the wings, tail and rear fuselage. At the time, English Electric were looked down upon and seen as newcomers by the much more established makers, even though they had considerably more experience with supersonic aircraft. This split contract also meant the project had split management and split assembly lines that were well over 100 miles apart. There was also a lot of extra management input into the design from the Defence Ministry, all this extra input leading to extended deadlines and increasing costs. The aerodynamics for the futuristic P-17 had impressed, and the shape would provide the distinctive look for the new jet. Together, Vickers and English Electric formed a new company with the Bristol Aeroplane Company and Hunting Aircraft, under the name BAC, or British Aircraft Corporation. Their project soon became known as Tactical Strike Reconnaissance Aircraft, or TSR-2. 30 years earlier, the fairy swordfish had flown the first TSR as Torpedo Spotter Reconnaissance Plane. But the acronym gave some impression of the advanced capabilities of Britain's new special aircraft. TSR-2 would be fitted with the most advanced electronic systems in the world, with independent targeting and front and sideways looking radars. The engines would be two Olympus 22Rs developed by Bristol Sidley, 
which would later power the Concorde. The new engine was an advanced turbojet but at the time was also untested and its development caused major setbacks to the development of the TSR2. In 1962, the engine burst into flames during a ground test on a modified Vulcan, destroying both the plane and the engine. There were also problems fitting the Olympus into the fuselage. There was so little clearance between the two that each engine had to be precisely measured to ensure it would fit into a particular aircraft. But on the 27th of September 1964, the first prototype, XR219, took its first flight from Boscombe Down in Wiltshire. The aircraft handled beautifully, according to the test pilots, like a big version of the English Electric's supersonic lightning. However, the first test flights revealed problems with the landing gear. The long stroke design necessary for a super short takeoff and landing produced huge lateral vibrations on touchdown, which went through the entire fuselage and happened to coincide with the resonant frequency of the human eyeball. The result of this vibration was to cause the pilot's eyes to shake, giving a brief moment of blindness for the pilot's Roland Beaumont on landing. Engineers worked around the clock to fix the issues one by one, and by early 1965, XR219 was flying well. In the first and only supersonic test, the prototype broke the sound barrier with just one of its engines on reheat, leaving its Lightning Escort, which had both engines on full reheat, in the dust. A second prototype was about to begin testing, and 17 aircraft were in varying stages of completion. However, Political forces were moving against the project behind closed doors, and its cost overruns and delays only added to the calls from those who opposed it. There was also inter-service rivalry between the RAF and the Navy, which deepened when the nuclear deterrent was given to the Navy in the form of the Polaris submarines, and the RAF V-bombers were sidelined. The Navy disliked the large sums of money that were going into the TSR-2, an RAF project. When Labour won the general election in 1964, there was also the belief that they would undo much of what the Tories had started, including the TSR2. The RAF were due to take 150 airframes, and the first international order of a TSR2 was to be 30 airframes from the Australian Air Force. However, when the British Chief of Defence Staff, Lord Mountbatten, who was a Navy man and one of the TSR-2's biggest critics, visited Australia, he actively tried to persuade them to order the Navy's Blackburn Buccaneer instead. He talked up the TSR-2 setbacks and hinted that the jet might never make it into production. Meanwhile, the new British Prime Minister, Harold Wilson, had been visiting the United States with the Defence Minister, Dennis Healy. The Americans also viewed the TSR-2 as a direct threat to their own aviation programs like their swing-wing aircraft, the General Dynamics F-111 Aardvark. They'd offered the Australians the F-111 at a knockdown price, and the pitch worked. The RAAF withdrew their order for the TSR-2 and instead went for the American F-111. In the April 1965 budget, the newly elected Labour government announced the cancellation of the whole previously Tory-led project apparently because of budget and schedule overruns. But then, in an unprecedented move, both before and since, someone ordered that all the tools, jigs and part-completed aircraft be destroyed. Even a wooden mock-up of the TSR-2 was dragged out onto the runway and burned. Somebody, somewhere, wanted to ensure that there will be no chance of the project coming back to life. The workers at BAC were baffled, as were the national press and the public. The TSR-2, a world-beater and pride of the aviation industry, would come to nothing. Many of the highly skilled workers lost their jobs and ended up going to America. Britain then placed an order for 50 F-111s. But the American aircraft also overran in cost and delivery dates, just like the TSR-2. Some say that the Americans put pressure on the UK government in return for backing for the upcoming IMF loan to the UK, but both parties have denied that. 
Eventually though, with the weakening of a pound against the dollar, the whole deal fell through anyway. The RAF repurposed the V-bombers to do low altitude missions until a newly modified Buccaneer and an order for American F-4 Phantoms took over the Canberra's reconnaissance role. BAC, desperate to keep the knowledge gained in the high-speed jet design alive, offered to use the only flying TSR-2 for 100 hours of research for one and a half million pounds. The knowledge gained from this research would go towards the new supersonic Concorde project, which was to use the same engines, but the government refused. The cancellation of the TSR-2 marked a decisive point as Britain stepped back from its ambition to lead the world in aerospace design, almost as if the government of the day and successive ones have lacked faith in their own homegrown industries even when they were world beaters. Only two airframes remained after a decade of development, over £200 million spent in investment. XR219, the only prototype to have flown, ended up being used for target practice at the Shubri Ness test range. XR220, the second prototype, however, was luckier and can be seen at the RAF Museum in Cosford. Considering the extent of the destruction of almost anything to do with the TSR2 after it was cancelled, including photos and film, it may be surprising to know that a third, although much less complete airframe, XR222, also survived, and after an extensive restoration, it now resides at the Imperial War Museum at Duxford. A lot of the knowledge gained from the TSR-2 ended up in the Panavia Tornado, which did pretty much what the RAF had originally wanted, but with a plane built by an international consortium instead of a truly British one. So thanks for watching, and this episode's shirt was the Trip Clouds by Madcap England and is available from Atom Retro with worldwide shipping from here in the UK. I would also like to thank all of our patrons for their ongoing support and if you are interested in supporting the channel then you can find out more by clicking on the link now showing. So thanks again for watching and please subscribe, thumbs up and share.